Uh, have you got your antennas on? Yes. yes. Are you listening? Yes. Wonderful. Today, I believe, maybe more than any. Okay, hold on a moment. Yes, I'm on. I know exactly what I have to do. Thank you very much. Today, I believe more than any other day, you're going to be challenged to dig into the word. Therefore, may I encourage you to have a pen, pencil, paper, or your iPad ready, because uh, we're going to dig into some scriptures that you may not want to look up while you're listening to the word, and you may just want to jot them down so that you can look at your notes later on. Okay? Wonderful. Um, it'll be very, very important that you do look at your scriptures later on. Uh, we're going back to the well today. The Word of God. Amen? Amen? Most of what I will be sharing with you today may be repetition to you. However, may I mention that when you go back to a well, you don't say, Oh my goodness, we're going back to that boring water again. <laughs> the reason for going to the well is that you have a necessity for water. Whether it's to put it within or whether you use it without, you need water. As the children of God, any time we go back to those places we've been in the past, there should always be a fresh sense of anticipation. Do you have that sense of anticipation this morning? Okay. <laughs> For wells represent life, prosperity, and abundance. And as I went through my notes while I was at the Bible Learning Center way back in the early 80s with Pastor Joanne Bunce, I came across a title in, which was called, If It Be Thy Will. A, teacher, uh, a teaching that our Bible teacher at that time taught us and reflecting on my notes, I pondered whether I would be able to create a teaching on this very subject. And asking the Holy Spirit to help me in creating a teaching, he gave me a fresh sense of anticipation. The title of today's message, therefore, is Unleash, If It Be Thy Will. Now this is part one of a two-part message. Okay, so be prepared. Let's start off with thanking the Lord. Abba Father, my God, this morning I stand before you as I am the female part of Adam, teaching a word by and through the Holy Spirit. May your word be an enrichment which will lead your beloved into a fuller, richer understanding of their rights and privileges in your family as joint heirs with your son, our brother, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Body of Christ, because we live in a time period when God has raised up such a variety of teachers in the word and in the body of Christ, we have been instructed about how we ought to pray from a variety of angles. We've been taught about intercession and many other ways of prayer. However, there seems to be a phrase in one of the most meaningful prayers ever prayed that seems to be strange and inconsistent to the way of faith in the New Testament. It seems to be a contradiction to the way teachers have taught you to pray. We have taught you that according to the word of God, when you pray, believe that you have received and you will have what you believe and pray for. And we have taught you that you are to see it in the spiritual realm and bring it down into the natural. Father, uh, further I should say, we have taught you that if we say, Father, if it be thy will, it's a prayer of doubt and unbelief. Why? Because it starts off with a negative, if. 
not a positive. Yet we are often hit over the head by this particular phrase and the particular prayer which Jesus himself prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane on his way to Calvary when he prayed, Father, if it be thy will. Everybody ready with your pens? Because you're going to get a lot of scriptures. Please turn with me to, in your Bibles to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Matthew 26. We're starting at verse 54, and we're going to read right through to 56. And as you know, I will be using the Amplified Bible. Are you there yet? Verse 54. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must come about this way? At 55. At that moment, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber to capture me? Day after day, I was accustomed to sit in the porches and courts of the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place in order that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him, fleeing, escaped. Please don't leave. <laughs> don't escape. <laughs> Body of Christ, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. And no one knew that more than Jesus Christ the Lord. For he was in the process of fulfilling it. Now leave your bookmark there. And let's look at Mark, the 14th chapter. We're going to start at verse 34, and we're going to read right through until verse 35. And I believe this is the heart of our teaching. Verse 34, and he said to them, to whom is Jesus talking to here? His disciples, thank you. As you know, you can note that in verse 32. My soul is exceedingly sad, overwhelmed with grief, so that it almost kills me. Remain here and keep awake and be watching. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and kept praying that if it were possible, the fatal hour might pass from him. Now, Jesus didn't just pray this prayer once, did he? For it tells us that he kept praying. He did everything that seemed to be an indication of doubt and unbelief, and yet he prayed it several times. He said, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now remember, he was repairing the broken bridges at this time. Verse 36, and he was saying, Abba, which means Father, everything is possible for you. Take away this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Verse 37, and he came back and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Have you not the strength to keep awake and watch with me for one hour? Do you sometimes have difficulty just praying for one hour? Never mind an hour, but a half an hour or 15 minutes? Please note here that Peter and the disciples neglected to watch and pray. The only thing which could have saved them from failure at this time of testing for in verse 56, it tells us they all forsook him and fled. Body of Christ, listen carefully. Failure in our Christian life is absolutely certain without prayer. 
Let's go on. Verse 38. Keep awake and watch and pray constantly that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Please underline that. The flesh is weak. Verse 39, he went away again and prayed, saying the same words. Father, everything is possible for you. Take away this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. What is meant by this cup? What cup is he talking about? What cup is he talking about? Anyone? Now, supper. It is doubtful that Jesus is praying to be saved from physical death, right? For he had resolutely set himself to die for the sin of mankind. Mark 10, verse 33 and 34. Luke 9, 51. John 12, 24, and 27, and Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 9. It is more probable that he was praying to be delivered from the punishment of sin separation from God. Christ prayed that his physical death might be accepted as full payment for the sin separation of mankind. However, he prayed, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. He then committed himself to undergo both physical death and spiritual separation from his heavenly Father in order to achieve or to obtain our salvation. The cross reference to that is chapter 27 of the same book, verse 46. Now the Greek word for cup here in this particular verse is mianiya. No, I said that wrong. Miaino. Miaino. A primary verb meaning to sully or taint contaminate or defile. Am I going too fast with the scriptures? I will slow down. Is there a, a scripture that you've missed that I can let you know? The last one? Hebrews 10, 5 through 9? Oh, I cross-referenced the same book, chapter 27, verse 46. No, that's Mark. Mm -hmm. We're in the same book as what we were, we're in Mark right now. I'm going to start from these, what cup is he talking about? The question, these questions have been a subject of much discussion. First of all, it is doubtful that Jesus was praying to be saved from physical death. For he had resolutely set himself to die for the sin of mankind. I have about four scriptures here. Cross-reference Mark 10, 33. And verse 34. Luke 9, verse 51. John 12, verses 24 and 27. Hebrews 10, 5 through 9. And because Jesus prayed, nevertheless, not, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will, he then committed himself to undergo both physical death 
and spiritual separation from his father in order to achieve and to obtain our salvation. The cross reference to that is the same chapter that we're in, which is Mark, chapter 27, verse 46. Do we have it now? Yes? Oh, it's, sorry. It's Matthew. I knew I'd make a mistake somewhere along the line. I should have written it in. So the, the word for cup in this verse is miaino, meaning to sully or taint, defile or contaminate. Here it is, the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper was contaminated due to the disciples drinking from it and placing within the cup their sin separation from God. And Jesus taking the cup, drinking it dry, became their sin separation, defiling himself which almost killed him. He knew no sin. He knew no separation from the Father. And now he was experiencing it and it almost killed him. Matthew 26, please. Verse 39. And going a little farther, he threw himself upon the ground on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, not what I desire, but what you will and you desire. Now consider then this statement, not what I desire, but what you desire, your will. In other words, I always do what pleases my Father. I always do what pleases Him. Him being the Father, His Father, your Father, and my Father. Body of Christ, do we dare take that statement as our personal goal in life? Aha, uh -huh. this is where the rubber meets the road. Are we truly willing to scrutinize all our activities, our goals, our plans, and our impulsive actions in the light of this statement? Am I doing this to please you, God? Verse 40, please, of the same chapter. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. My goodness, they do a lot of sleeping, don't they? And he said to Peter, What? Are you so utterly unable to stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour. All of you must keep awake, give strict attention, be cautious and active, and watch and pray that you may not come into temptation. Now I could start a whole new message just on that verse alone. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now did we not just read that in Mark? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Don't you sometimes have that your spirit is willing, but you are just especially coming after a honeymoon and then going all the way to Florida. I'm sure that your spirit was quite willing to pray when you got home, but your flesh wasn't going to have any part of it. Verse 42, again, a second time he went away and prayed, My father, 
if this cannot pass by unless I drink it, your will be done. Now go with me to John, the 14th chapter, the 10th verse. I'm going to wait until you get there because I want your attention. John 14, the 10th verse. Do you feel as if you're in college, writing down all your information? Good. Are you there yet? Yes. Consider the way that you've just heard Jesus pray. Was there despair and even discouragement in his prayer? There seemed to be doubt, and certainly he is an extremely heavy spiritual battle. Yet here in John, the 14th chapter and the 10th verse, Jesus talked like this to his disciples. Do you not believe that I am the Father? That I am in the Father? and that the Father is in me. What I am telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own words, but the Father who lives continually in me does the works, his own miracles, deeds of power. Now, how many of you know that this is an uncompromising statement? The Father lives in me. The Father does the works that I do. Remember, body of Christ, Jesus was talking to Jews who weren't even allowed to say the name of God. And here is Jesus calling him Father. And he lives in me. You can't say that and be weak and be in doubt. Pardon? All right, then let's look at John, the 17th chapter, the 14th verse again. I have John 17. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't send you there. John 17, please. Verse 14. Yes. I have given and delivered to them your word, your message, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Do not belong to the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, earlier in verse 8 of the same chapter, Jesus says, for the uttered words that you gave me I have given them for the uttered words. What a beautiful statement. Jesus heard those words. He heard the Father speak those words. And he gave those words to his disciples. Let's remember that. He's giving that word to you and me at the same time. It's all here for us. Now go to verse 25 and 26 in the same chapter of John 17. I hope I have this right. Verse 25. O oh, just and righteous Father, although the world has not known you and has failed to recognize you and has never acknowledged you, I have known you continually. Just stop and think about what he just said. I have known you continually. Yet we read at the beginning of this teaching the words of a man who's saying, if it be your will. Remember how intimately he spoke of his relationship with his father. 
He spoke of the way that he knew his father's every word because he came to do his father's every will and every act. He came to be obedient to his father's will continually, not just for Sunday mornings. It's just like, you know, when you receive Jesus in your heart, he didn't come to reside in your heart for a vacation. He came into your heart to be with you continually. He doesn't leave after two weeks and says, well, my vacation is over. I'm going to leave you now. He stays with you continually. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jamie. He's continually in us. Are we continually in him? Let's just consider that verse again. O oh, just and righteous Father, although the world has not known you and has failed to recognize you and has never acknowledged you, I have known you continually. Whew. Now go on to verse 26. I have made your name known to them and revealed your character and your very self. And I will continue to make you known that the love which you have bestowed on me may be in them, felt in their hearts, and that I myself may be in them. Whew. Boom. That I may, I myself may be in them. Now go with me to Leviticus. The third book in the, in the, Old, in the Old Testament. Leviticus. Leviticus, the first chapter. Oh, thank you, Lord. Leviticus 1. Now just put your finger at the fourth verse and pay attention. Chapter 1, verse 4, Leviticus. You got your finger there? Have I got your attention? Wonderful. This is where we will be establishing the Levitical order. Let me ask you, was Jesus talking throughout his ministry to Jews? Did he not say that I am not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Yes, he did. If you want to check that out, it's in Matthew 15, verse 24. Weren't his disciples all Jews? Yes, they were. Did his disciples then know Jewish traditions and worship? Did they know the Levitical order? Yes. Yes and yes. They were, now listen carefully. They were observing the Passover just before his crucifixion. He was buried at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they knew the order of fasting and worship that Jesus and his disciples were observing. Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, which was on the Friday, hence Good Friday. And everything had to be prepared before the Sabbath, which was the Saturday. The Pharisees and the priests wanted Jesus crucified before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which started on the Saturday, the same day the Passover commenced. He was buried at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and as I mentioned a moment ago, they knew the order of fasting and worship that Jesus and his disciples were observing. 
It was the order of worship from this book of Leviticus. Now let me just give you a little background or an account of the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is closely related to the book of Exodus. Exodus records how the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, received God's law, and built the tabernacle according to God's pattern. Leviticus contains God's instruction to Moses during the two months between the completion of the tabernacle, Exodus 40, verse 17, and Israel's departure from Mount Sinai, Numbers 10, 11. The purpose of this book was written to instruct the Israelites and their priestly mediators about their access to God by means of atoning blood and to make clear God's standard of holy living for his chosen people. Leviticus preeminently involves two major commands, and these are atonement and holiness. We are going to concentrate on atonement in this uh, teaching. Because of the twofold emphasis on blood atonement and holiness, this book has enduring relevance for believers under the New Covenant. For the New Testament teaches that the atoning blood of sacrificial animals, prominent in Leviticus, was a shadow of good things to come, Hebrews 10, verse 1, and pointed to Christ's once and for all time sacrifice for sin, Hebrews 9, 12. Did you get that? The command to be holy can be fully realized through the precious blood of Christ in the new covenant believer whose calling is to be holy in all areas of life. 1 Peter 1.15 The second great commandment as stated by Yahweh was in fact derived from Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're not going to concentrate on that, but I have a cross-reference for you regarding this. Matthew 5, 43 through 46. And Romans 12, verse 17 and 19. Now we're flipping back and forth, but it will all come together next week. Now that we have a little insight on the book of Leviticus, let's look at the fourth verse. Aha, this is good. Mary, I don't have a goat and I don't have a sheep. I don't have a bull. And I've tried for a week or two to figure out how I can do this the best. You're just going to have to visualize like I do. I get a picture of everything, as you all know. All right, here we go. Verse 4. And he shall lay his hands upon the head of the animal, or the burnt offering, transferring symbolically his guilt to the victim. And it shall be an acceptable atonement for him. Lay his hands upon An Israelite sacrificing an animal leaned on the animal. Can you picture a sheep? Can you picture a sheep? Well, one or two you can. Picture a sheep. Have you got the picture? Have you got it in front of me? Have, can you see the head? This is your sacrificial animal. This is the man, mankind, put his two head hands on the head of that animal, atoning for his sin. When the priest did that once a year at Passover, he would put his hands on top of the animal's head and he would atone for the sins of Israel. 
not just for himself, but for all the people of Israel. Have you got the picture? Okay, do you see the sheep? Okay, it's without blemish, okay? This act presented the idea of substitution. When the animal died, it was as if the person who brought it also died. Oh, my goodness. When Jesus came, when you asked Jesus in your heart, did you not die? Oh, you should have. <laughs> Yet that person stayed alive to worship God, presenting themselves as living sacrifices to God. Cross-reference that, Romans 12, verse 1. Hebrews 13, 15. Hmm. In other words, the picture here is that of the man. Remember, Yahweh was the man, the last Adam, taking the particular sacrificial animal depending on his sin, and he would lay his hand upon the head of that animal, and he would transfer all of his sin onto that animal. I repeat, transferring all his sin of himself into that sinless animal. Transferring the sin, if you will, into the bloodstream of that animal. Yahweh said the very life of anything is where? is in the blood. So the life and all it represents is in the blood. Your life and all it represents is in your blood. If we took the blood away, what would happen? Ha, there'd be no more. In this chapter and verse, Jesus is mentioned as the Lord speaking to Moses here. The blood was the life of the representative and all the lives that he represented. The life is in the blood. It is so important that you get that. This sentence is the scarlet cord, if you will, which runs throughout the whole word of God. Blood sacrifices had therefore great significance. Blood offered an atonement for sin separation, but its incompleteness required the perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ, is he not the perfect sacrifice? Yes. The sacrifice in chapters such as this taught the Israelites how to worship God through personal commitment. This is where I'm leaving you this week. Hanging, if you will. <laughs> or just an introduction. So that you have time to go over your scriptures at home and that you'll be ready next week because I gave you a lot. Next week we will continue with the same chapter, the same verse. But in the meantime, as you go you're on your way, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. I'm, just, I'm just saying that uh, there's a lot, we received a lot today, right? But I want to remind you, there's, this will be on SoundCloud, so you'll be able to listen to it several times a day if you need to. And it will also be on YouTube, so you can watch it several times if you need to. All you have to do is punch in Andrew and Helen Smith, provided you have SoundCloud. And if you punch in Andrew and Helen Smith, it'll take you to the series that we have of, of, of teachings on SoundCloud, and the same with YouTube. If you punch in Andrew and Helen Smith, it'll take you to all of the YouTube presentations that we have up uh, to date.
Just wanted to say that. Okay. That's wonderful. Did you get something out of that today? Was there, some, was there something there that you didn't know?